last scheduled speaker is Nadia Vidro, one of the newest PhDs, and uh, who wrote, uh, worked with Jeffrey in Cambridge on an abridgment of a coffee, which is an abridgment of the English meal. And she'll be talking now about Karait pedagogical grammars and their place in the linguistic tradition of the Karaites. Yeah, I'm sorry to distract you from your fruitful discussion with Jeffrey. You have to suffer with me. And I think I'm sure. Um, well, we have the taxis. I have to start at five. I have an hour and a half. <laughs> Don't worry. I think actually you'll have to take a photo from here. It's a survivor's photo. <laughs> Okay, I hope you can see it because it's just a PDF and not a PowerPoint. If you can't, there's enough place nearer to the screen. Um, so my topic today is Karaite pedagogical grammars and their place in the linguistic tradition of the Karaites. And I think it's a good topic for somebody who doesn't know much about grammar. The pedagogical grammar is your place to start. Um, to quickly re recapitulate what Jeff already told you, uh, it is um, common to divide the Karait grammatical thought into two periods. First, the early works on which Jeffrey now concentrates, grammatical commentaries to difficult places in the text of the Bible, and then comes systematic, all-encompassing, comprehensive, comprehensive investigations of all aspects of Biblical Hebrew. I take here the term classical grammar from the title of Jeffreys and Noratel's edition of Velkidab um, el My own work on grammars that were composed after the works of Abu Farah Charon convinced me that the second stage when grammars started to be composed as real literary texts can be divided into two consecutive stages, namely scholarly grammars, indeed large, comprehensive, in-depth and complex um, works on biblical grammar and basing on them pedagogical grammars. These pedagogical grammars um, as the name already says, and this is the term that I invented myself, so I'll be very happy if you challenge me on that. Um, these pedagogical grammars were intended for beginning students of Hebrew grammar. And when I say beginning students of Hebrew grammar, I definitely mean people who already know Biblical Hebrew from uh, the synagogue, from their life in the Jewish community. So, um, I mean, people who are starting to learn and to study Hebrew grammar as a discipline, who are beginning to gain active mastery of Hebrew forms. These grammars um, abbreviate works uh, composed at the stage of scholarly grammar in the sense that they mainly concentrate on morphology, verbal, and to a lesser extent nominal and leave, say, syntax and semantics and some lexicological issues dealt with in Abu Faraj's grammars on the outskirts. Moreover, to make learning easier for beginners, they are composed using many didactic tools and also um, are more explanatory in the beginning than they are towards the end. So they kind of gradually introduce one to the study of grammar. One grammatical text that I discovered that certainly is a pedagogical grammar is Kitab al fi Qusarif al al or the Book of Rules regarding the grammatical inflections of the Hebrew language. This text was initially discovered by Hirschfeld, who assigned it to Abul Farah but textual evidence does not support this attribution, so until new evidence is discovered, we must say that the text is anonymous. It was composed in Jerusalem in the, the middle of the 11th century and was commissioned and initially intended as an epitome of Al-Kitab al, al 
However, it is much more than an epitome, really. It is an epitome in the sense that it shortens significantly everything syntactical, lexicographical, lexicological. But it has significantly blown up morphological parts, where Abul Faraj has two short chapters. Kitab al -Okud has, uh, well, in the main manuscript, about 80 folios. Being largely devoted to verbal conjugations, it is a reference tool on verbal morphology for beginning students. And this is also how the author determines, determined his purpose in composing the works. To quote, rules pertaining to conjugations would be established and all conjugations would be brought together as a basis to which one could refer and which would be, could be studied in a short time. Uh, when I say that pedagogical grammars were addressed to beginners, I think that it, it, it also follows from the comments the author left in his text. And I think these comments reflect the fact that he met beginners face to face and had first-hand knowledge what is difficult for them, what is easy for them, what they know, what they need. And yet he says this can often be obscure for beginners, I considered it necessary to mention this because I noticed that beginners mix up one with the other or other passages that I don't bring up here in the presentation. If you ask a beginner about this and this kind of work, he'll give you this answer, whereas if you learned, he'd give you a, a more correct answer. So I think he draws on his own experience when composing a grammar for beginning students. To help learn, the author used an array of didactic strategies. I won't um, torture you with all of them. You can open my book and read. <laughs> but I'll just show a few to convince you maybe a little bit more that it is indeed a pedagogical grammar. For example, the book describes verbal conjugation and brings, and brings many, many paradigms of Hebrew verbs. About 50, 60 paradigms of different sorts of verbs. Because it is a Karaite grammar, it is not based on the notion of binyanim. So the author has to divide verbs into groups, as is more convenient for his description. Uh, and he decides to describe paradigms of very narrow groups of verbs so that in each group all verbs are exactly identical. For example, for Hitpael, he'll give sample paradigms for seven types of verbs. Hithalef for strong verbs, Hithyahed for middle weak verbs without compensatory lengthening, Histabel for first sibilant verbs with metaphysis, then histapeh with metaphysis and third guttural, hitbarech, histarer, histarea. So you can see every single combination of um, morphological feature, like sibilants, gutturals in the middle, gutturals at the end, will, it des deserves a separate paradigm in the view of the author. And he explains, this way, they will be easier to grasp and simpler to understand for a beginner. And clear matters will not be obscured by unclear ones. Basically, you won't have to work out how to conjugate a first sibilant, sibilant third guttural verb by only looking at the paradigm of a strong verb. You have it all here. Just learn it. But how much can you learn, asks the author. What can I include in my account so that it's, it is still feasible uh, for students to learn it? Well, he decides I include strong verbs, oh, well, verbs of common patterns, schmor da ber himalet, verbs of rare patterns but still fairly regular, for example, hasmael, like, which is the only one. Uh, for radical hif il in the Bible, or herafe, which is the only nif al, which is first rage and third aleph. He says, I included them so that a beginner knows how to conjugate an exceptional verb in case he's asked about it or wants to know it for himself. But then he excludes <laughs> words that are really regular and abnormal in the text of the Bible, like hishtachave or the hypothetical 
Kunen from uh, He explains his position saying, apart from the non-extensive conjugations I have mentioned above, those I put in item two, there remain others which have not been included in any symbol so that they do not complicate the learning. They're too regular, you don't see them often in the Bible, there's no need to include them in a reference to on biblical grammar. But even so, even if you restrict yourself to regular and fairly regular verbs, you get to about 60 conjugation, 60 paradigms. They're not easy to learn 60 paradigms. Unless you have any idea how it all works, what, this is, what the logic of the system is. And to help readers understand the logic of the Hebrew verbal system and to help them learn, we're basing on this logic, the author devised a very original device in the Karaite morphological tradition, uh, Karaite grammatical tradition, which are rules of derivational relations. They are implicational rules which help you connect between different forms of the same verb. He says, if a verb has form A, which is so-and-so, it will necessarily have form B, which is so-and-so. For example, whenever an imperative begins in a root letter or an auxiliary letter, I won't go into details what an auxiliary letter is, it doesn't matter, the past form will begin in that same letter. This is the way of the language and a rule without exceptions. For example, if you have an imperative like dappe, which begins in a root letter, its past form, dipper, will begin in the same letter, dalit. On the other hand, if you have an imperative like himalet, an if al imperative beginning on a he, its past will be nimlat, in a nun. So, here's one of the rules. And again, they were introduced with a pedagogical function in mind. I have presented first the discussion of the rules pertaining to paradigms, so that he who studies the paradigms can examine them one by one, and that will settle down in his mind, and he will remember them. When he masters these principles, it will not be difficult for him to complete the paradigms. Uh, so these are three examples of didactical tools. Well, there are also mnemonics, but I'll probably save you the mnemonics. <laughs> And I wanted to give you an example of a chapter in Kitab al which deals with a really trivial matter of uh, Hebrew morphology, and still the author finds it necessary to bring it up, addressing his beginning students. Uh, you will all know that a written Hebrew word often consists of a number of elements, a lexeme with, a, say, a definite article, the, the conjunctive ve, um, a pronoun at the end, a preposition in the beginning. If you see a form like bivnotchem, it is difficult to directly assign it to a particular paradigm and see what the forms of this word, word would be. You need to first clean it of the additional elements. And here in Kitab al-Qud you find a whole chapter on stripping words of added letters in order for a word to return to its basic form without additions, which teaches you how to get rid of the unnecessary letters and find the, fir the form of a verb which you can put into the paradigm and decide how to conjugate it. Um, I give you one of the examples where he de deals with words based on active participles. Very straightforward. On stripping words based on active participles, for example, ha holchim, ha hofchim, ha mevakshim, so, uh, plural participles with the active article. No, oh, active article. Definite <laughs> article. <laughs> Maybe I should write down <laughs> two weeks. If you strip the he's of definiteness from the beginning of the participles, they will become indefinite. Holchim, hofchim, mevakshim. Then, if you strip them of the yud and mem of the plural, what will remain is holech, hofech, mevakshim. Mevakshim, you is derived from the same uh, imperative bakshe which Jeffrey talked about. Um, 
And now then you have, when you already have Holech, Hofech, Homevakshe, you can look in the paradigms where they fit and will know how to conjugate it and how to attribute them to an imperative. Um, what else? Biblical passages are used as texts to demonstrate methods of analysis. For example, in the beginning of his book, the author deals with the definition and um, characteristic features of the three parts of speech, the noun, the verb, and the particle. Having explained and defined and um, given all the details about these three parts of speech, he uses the beginning of the Bible to demonstrate how it all works. He says, I will now analyze a portion from Genesis so that the entire scripture and the rest of the language be treated by analogy. If someone says, is the word Bereshit a noun, a verb, or a particle? Tell him it is a noun, because the letter bet is, a, bet is affixed to it, which is one of his uh, characteristic features of a noun, um, that you can affix certain letters. Bara is a verb because it refers to the past tense. Elohim is a noun because the letters Lamed Mem Nun, uh, Lamed Mem Kaf Bet Hey can be affixed to it, as it is said, Melohim, Belohim. And so on him, he analyzes uh, the entire first five verses of Bereshit into nouns, verbs, and particles just to demonstrate how it works and to get his beginners accustomed to the idea of it. Now, here I hope you agree with me that Kitab al is a pedagogical grammar. Um, what influenced this pedagogical mindset had for the grammatical theory you find in Kitab al -Kud. I'd claim his grammatical ideas are also influenced by the audience uh, the author is addressing with his book. Kitab al -Kud, as I said, is, as, as I said in the beginning, is um, an abridgment of Al-Kitab al kafi And indeed, it follows Abu al-Faraj in issues of theoretical divergence from the early tradition, where Abu al-Faraj um, um, stated that infinitive rather than imperative as the primary verb form on the grounds of its semantic priority, where Abu al-Faraj dismissed passive imperative basis such as rukem for rukamti or kurbel for mechurbal as semantically unsound because you can't really have a passive imperative. In all this the theoretical and rather um, in all these theoretical issues, Kitab al followed Abu al-Faraj. However, it differs from Abu al-Faraj and agrees with the early tradition in the approach to verbal derivation. Um, well, everybody mentions Jeffrey's work, so I won't be the one who doesn't. And <laughs> in Jeffrey's... Um, in Jeffrey's analysis of the current grammatical tradition, you will all find a description of two approaches to verbal derivations in to verbal derivation in the current grammatical tradition. One group of grammarians preferred to posit imperative basis of a regular pattern and to explain irregularities in verb forms by phonetic processes, by elision, addition. Uh, and similar processes, whereas another group claimed that an imperative base must necessarily reflect all key structural elements of its occurring derivative form, even at the cost of being hypothetical. The first approach was characteristic of Abul Farage, whereas the second uh, you find reflected in the early grammar and in Kitab al -Qud, even after Abul Farage's works. Uh, take, for example, the participle form mevakshe without the dagesh in the kuf. According to the first approach, the imperative base is bakesh, where the dagesh was elided. Um, according to the second approach, the imperative base is bakshe, and forms with and without germination should not be mixed together and treated as part of the same paradigm. You'll probably think that the example of Mevakshe and Bakshe is the only one in the Karai tradition because we both bring it up. But 
by chance, really. So Kitab al follows in the steps of the early tradition and posits imperative basis which are as close as possible to the occurring forms. Apart from the example of Bakshe, Mevakshe and Bakshe, I can give you here the, his derivation in the, of his ill words, where from forms like Yartiach, Mit, Hirek, and Khatav Patach, he, for, for this form, he'll posit the imperative Harteach with Ser and Khatav Patach, and from a form with Patach, uh, the imperative Hashba. The two different two different paradigms for the author of Kitab al because otherwise the structure is not kept. And moreover, in his theory, um, structural analysis, even with semantics, where I just said that he refused to accept passive imperatives, as the early grammarians said, if you can find structural analogies between a passive verb and an active verb, he is very happy to accept a passive imperative. For example, in the Bible you find an active form zormu. What? <laughs> um, and a passive uh, they were uh, extinct. And then he's happy uh, if from Zormu you can have an imperative Zorem, an active imperative, then from the structurally identical Doho, you can easily have the imperative Doef, be extinct. I would say that this return to structuralism can be explained by the pedagogical intention of the author. Indeed, a system of verbal derivation which is com based on complete structural analysis and complete structural analysis analogy is much easier to master and much easier to understand for a beginner. You you get the idea of how it works, and everything works according to the same paradigm. You no longer need to find, to remember exceptions and phonetic processes, these are more difficult. So I would say that to make life easier for students, the author of Kitab al chose to draw on the early tradition and to be, somehow betray his loyalty to Abul Faraj. Um, yeah, what happened with Kitab al and with these ideas? Did it stop there? Luckily not. Um, a text entitled Mo'or Ein, an anonymous text composed in the end of the 11th century, presumably in Byzantium, um, is a compilation adapted from a number of Karaite sources, but is mainly based on Kitab al especially in the part on verbal paradigms where Me'or Ayn condenses Kitab uh, If you want to have a look at Me'or Ayn, it has been published in 1990 by Mikhail Zeslin. The translation is unfortunately into Russian, so you have to learn Russian first. <laughs> uh, and the introduction is in Russian as well, so. But the text itself is in Hebrew. Um, Me'or Ayn, fully adopted the grammatical and also the pedagogical system of Kitab al -Qud. And one would believe that with Me'or Ayn, this pedagogical system traveled to Byzantium. Um, Kitab al -Qud was written in the middle of the 11th century, Me'or Ayn in the end of the 11th century, uh, around the destruction of, some, sometime around the destruction of the Karaite center in Jerusalem, when Karaites and Grammar with them traveled to Byzantium. And it is common to say that around this area, uh, around this time, it's the end of Karaite creativity in the field of Grammar. Sometime in the 12th century, it is usually said, Karaites adopted the Rabbanite paradigm 
and no longer compose their own works of grammar that are distinct and a part of the Karaite tradition. I'm not here to deny this, but I would like to show you that vestiges and significant vestiges of the Karaite grammatical tradition in the form that it took in Karaite pedagogical grammars can be found after our eye, namely in Ishkol HaKofer. <coughs> The Shkola Hakofer was composed in the middle of the 12th century in Constantinople by Yehuda Hadassi, and it contains a number of grammatical alphabets. Um, not much grammatical work has been done on Shkola Hakofer. The only systematic uh, treatment of the grammatical alphabets in Shkola Hakofer that I'm aware of is Bachar's article in 1896 where he describes the contents of the grammatical alphabets and tries to determine, to determine the sources of Hadassi and to explain the meaning of Hadassi's text, which is, as you all know, is all often more poetical than <laughs> to the point. And Bacher identified Abraham ibn Ezra's Book Sefer Hamuznaim as the main source of um, Yehuda Hadassi's grammatical teachings. This is indeed so. Everything concerning verbal derivation in Yehuda Hadassi is taken from Sefer Hamuznaim. Since then, it is common in works on Hebrew grammar to say that Hadassi already <coughs> is so excited by the Rabbanite achievement in the uh, sphere of grammar that he is, he puts the end to the Karaite grammatical tradition. Um, I'm in a sense in a luckier position than Bacher was because we now know many more primary sources than he did. And drawing on the knowledge of this text, I would like to show you that Eshkol HaKofer has significant bits in his grammatical alphabets that draw on the Karaite tradition so that Eshkol HaKofer can still be put as one of the elements as the, of the Karaite tradition of grammar. Um, the one parallel with Maor Ayn, which is which was not discovered by me, but rather by Zislin, the editor of Meor Ein, are nominal patterns. Ishkol HaKofer, at the very end of its grammatical section, contains 35 patterns of nouns. It gives a list of nouns of each pattern with source verses. Exactly the same 35 patterns can be found in Meor Ein. There are again lists of nouns with source verses, but also paradigms of nouns with pronominal suffixes. And exactly the same 35 paradigms can be found in the treatise on the Hebrew nouns, which is a work of early Karaite grammar, a sister work of the treatise on the Hebrew verbs that uh, Jeffrey discussed in the previous uh, talk. Here you find 35 patterns of nouns where he gives lists of nouns with source verses, discussions of morphological issues, paradigms of nouns with pronominal suffixes. Um, Zislin, who noticed this parallel, says, um, I think Eshkola Kofer and Moor Ayn take it from, the son, from some other source, both. Like, not that Eshkola Kofer draws on Moor Ayn, but that they both take it from another source. Now that we know the source and we know that the source is in Arabic, it's more likely that Me'or Ayn took it from the Arabic text and the Shkola Koper from the Hebrew Me'or Ayn. So this is one parallel where you can say Shkola Koper continues uh, not only the Byzantine part of the Karaite grammatical tradition, but also the very early bit of it. Um, Another parallel that I found, and in Shkola Kofer you find, a, you find a division of utterances in a language into ten different types. And 
הגדה אומרת, זו שאלה קווסטיון, מצוות עשה, מצוות לא תעשה, בבקשה, השכרה, רצון לב, השכלה. The Ava and Hafla'a. It does not need to interest us what exactly he means by all these ten types of utterances. What is of interest for my purposes is that the only text where I could find exactly the same division of, um, of types of utterances is Ma'ar Ayn. Uh, and it, uses also not exact, it also uses exactly the same terms with uh, the exception of Hafetz and Ratzon Lev. In the middle, um, Sadia Gaon gives a division of types of sentences. Dunash gives a division of types of sentences. Ibn Janach gives a division of types of sentences, and they're all different. So I would claim Eshkola Kofer knows Meor Ein and draws on it. What else? I already mentioned uh, how Kitab al uses the beginning of Genesis to exemplify. Uh, nouns, verbs, and particles. And here in Kitab al uh, in Ishkol HaKofer, you read, Bereshit bara hu ma'aseh, I'll talk a little bit about terminology later, Bereshit bara hu ma'aseh, Elohim shem, Ed hu mesharet, Hashem hain shem, Ve'et mesharet, Ha'aretz shem. Ken derh kol lashon ha-Torah hu divrei nevi'av, Mesharet, ma'aseh, ve'shem. Here you also see the beginning of Bereshit, divided into nouns, verbs, and particles, exactly the same words used for exactly the same purpose. Uh, I will treat Me'or Ein here. You can probably do it quicker than I. <laughs> but um, it seems to me like that. Kitab al uh, the author of Kitab al uqud used this section uh, of Bereshit to exemplify the topic. Me'or Ein takes it over, translates it into Hebrew, sorry. Eshkola uh, Kofer takes it over again, condenses it significantly, and uses this basically as his definition of parts of speech. And pay attention to the terminology that Eshkola um, Kofer uses. Maase is his Hebrew term for verb, and it is the same term as is used in Me'or Ein. And it is not a common term at all. Uh, and not so, it is not clear to me that it is, can be found in Rabbanite grammar. I think it's a, Rabba, it's a Karaite term. And his term for particle is Misharet. Misharet, and also in Me'or Ayn, it is based on the Hebrew term, on the Judeo Arabic term Chadim, which was common in the early Karaite grammatical tradition. So that's another bit. And if you want a really verbatim citation, then this is um, the last parallel that I would like to draw your attention to. Uh, when discussing nouns and particles, Karaite grammarians usually come to the point where they need to determine the status of verbs like asher, vekama, vematai, are they nouns or particles? And um, discussions like that are already found in al mushtamil and then in Al-Kafi, then in Kitab al uqud then in Nur'ayn, and then in Ishkol al um, At least Kitab al uqud uh, at least Al-Kitab Al-Kafi, contains a long chapter on this issue. Nur'ayn contains ab uh, about... Um, Kitab al uqud gives about five lines on the whole issue of uh, the dis distinction about nouns and particles, out of which three I copied here. Uh, the text in Kitab al is translated into he Hebrew and Ma'or Ein, where he says uh, about uh, words like Asher, Kol el hamilot v'dumim, Im yavo lehem simanei Hashem, tishpot lehem ki em shemot, ve'im lo yavo lehem simanei Hashem, tida ki em meshartim. Almost exactly the same text you, you see in Eshkol HaKofer. Kol ele hamilot vekadome lehem. Im yavo lehem misimanei Hashem, dvukim, tichashvam kishimot, ve im lo yavo lehem misimanei Hashem, tichashvam mishartim zkukim. With the addition of some uh, beautifying uh, elements, this is exactly the same quotation, so you can clearly see that uh, Hadassi knew 
um, or Ayn, knew this Karai tradition of Hebrew grammar and based at least some of his grammatical um, of his grammat basically some parts of his grammar on the Karai's tradition rather than just completely adhering to the Rabbanite grammar. Well, terminology I've not discussed, I mentioned it quickly. Uh, and now to conclude. Um, I hope you agree with me that Karai's grammar got as far as Eshkola Kofe, didn't stop, uh, didn't stop before it. Importantly, important is not only that Eshkola Kofe knew Meor Ein, but also that Meor Ein was its gateway to the earlier tradition, to Kitab al -Qud and Finally, even to the earliest stages of Karaite grammar to the treatise on, on Hebrew nouns. It is in my eyes significant that pedagogical rather than scholarly grammars of Abu Faraj were adapted into Hebrew and transferred to Byzantium. Uh, correct me if you know better, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, Abu Faraj's work was not translated or adapted into Hebrew. Uh, his participation in the process of creation of Karai grammatical tradition basically um, stopped. He composed El Kafi, and then because it wasn't translated into Hebrew or adapted into Hebrew, later grammarians couldn't draw on this book, couldn't uh, quoted, couldn't, um, couldn't borrow from it so much. I would say that these were pedagogical rather than scholarly grammars that were transferred and translated and transferred because presumably they met their correct tar target audience. Presumably, presumably what was necessary were not in-depth, all-encompassing compositions on grammar but rather simple works that, um, that limited their scope to morphology, to those primary matters in grammar. It is interesting to note, however, that, for example, we, we find, well, a hundred or hundreds Fra fragments and manuscripts of Al-Kitab al kafi it, it was very widely uh, distributed and used, whereas of pedagogical grammars of Kitab al qud and of Meor Ayn, we have only, well, I have five copies of Kitab al qud and we have one manuscript of Meor Ayn. So there's a certain contradiction there between how much a book was read and how active a part it took in the transmission of the tradition. If you look at pedagogical grammars, they are related to the early grammar, to the works of Abu Faraj, and they transmitted this, this Arabic layer of Karaite grammar further to Byzantium and to Hebrew part of grammar. If you look at least at al um, its connection with the early grammar is mainly in that it breaks with it. It wasn't translated, it wasn't so much borrowed from due to not being translated. Um, so it is my impression that when we say that Abu Faraj was the peak of the development of the Karaite grammatical tradition, it was a very lonely peak. It was to a certain extent, he was a, to a certain extent an outsider in the in the in the tradition, and I wonder if in other areas of Karait studies or at least or in general of Jewish studies, we can see this phenomenon that the 
the gaon of the field is actually not so much a part of the tradition as an outsider and a lonely figure. And that the tradition goes near him. <laughs> um, I don't know if the picture that I presented now will change when we look more, when we have the chance to look more closely at uh, Al Kitab al Mushtamil because I gathered from Aaron's presentation that Al Kitab al Kafi is very different in nature from Al Mushtamil, and it seems to me from seems to me from what you said that Al Mushtamil might be a more down to earth grammar. So maybe all I said now will will change at least in a certain extent when we study al Mushtamil together with the rest of the material. And I think it is also a desideratum to edit Geniza fragments of Karai grammatical works that, uh, that exist in the collections. They will certainly edit, add to our picture and enrich it. it. Maybe change it, maybe just make it more colorful. That we'll see. Um, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, and indeed, for non-grammarians, it's fascinating <laughs> uh, presentation. It doesn't really a lot of, add a lot of light to it. Are there any comments, any questions? Just some short suggestions uh, regarding terminology. Mm -hmm. First, um, I think not uh, pedagogical, grammar, but uh, um, practical grammar. It's, mm -hmm. It seems better in this position than uh, what is called Mushtemi, not scholarly, but uh, probably comprehensive grammar, again, mm -hmm. I think. And Kitab uh, Kerfi probably uh, concise grammar. <laughs> Just three. Thank you. Suggestions. Um, what was your second? Concise. Concise. Oh, concise. Comprehensive. Yeah. yeah. Comprehensive is uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. long, yeah, yeah, yeah. Long, yeah, yeah, yeah. concise, is abbreviated, yeah. and yeah. for pedagogical yeah. aims, perhaps practical grammar. So I, I, I understand that these uh, grammars were not meant for teaching. Uh, Children, they were meant for somebody who wants to learn the language as an adult. This is my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. It's they are meant to teach you grammar rather than language, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah. <laughs> no, just a comment. I I really think in, in when you ponder what was the reason for uh, Abu Faraj's Kitab al Kafi or words not to be transmitted uh, as much as uh, the earlier Karai tradition of grammar, I think it probably it is the pedagogical factor that uh, matters most, because, more than his loneliness, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> because there are other figures who were not lonely at all, uh, even Tanakh, uh, Maimonides himself, in whose main works maybe are not the words that have been transmitted more in uh, later periods, but uh, summaries, adaptations, or easier versions of their works. And, uh, so, this yeah. is exactly what I meant by lonely. Oh, I didn't mean he closed no, himself yeah. up and never let anybody see his work. Yeah, I meant that he was... students and many pupils and still, because it, is a, it can be a great uh, work, but still difficult to understand for later generations. So whoever makes the, well, and it happens nowadays too, I think, uh, with books. Uh, bestsellers are usually adaptations or easier versions of something that is probably uh, more accurate but uh, more difficult to understand. So I think uh, really ped pedagogical or more practical is probably the key. Thank so. you. This was exactly. Oh, okay, uh, sorry, maybe you said another But no, thank know. you very much. Definitely. You said you would see it with Ibn Janakh. <laughs> I didn't know that we see it with Ibn Janakh. Uh, with, uh, yes, the later adaptations in the Provence uh, made in Hebrew by later scholars, uh, I think, uh, had probably more transmission than Ibn Janakh's uh, words in Judea. Wonderful, thank you.
Uh, just a uh, reply to Henry's uh, remark regarding the uh, book titles. I don't think they should be taken that seriously. I mean, Mojtamil is just a general term that says it's a comprehensive encyclopedic. Uh, but any, any book can be called Mojtamil. Other books uh, in this field uh, are called Al Hawi or Al Kamil. Al Hawi is a Haskell dictionary, which, which also uh, 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 refers to the, to the size of the book. Just uh, uh, words. Uh, there's another Al Hawi which is about to appear, which is an uh, encyclopedic book on philosophy, on so or on uh, halakha. Excuse me. Um, that's uh, David Hager uh, books, right? Um, El Elazar, um, Elazar ben ya Yaakov ben Elazar uh, composed a, a huge grammar entitled uh, El Kamil, which is also the <coughs> complete, comprehensive. So, El Kafi is not concise as uh, it should be or as it could be. And um, uh, it's, it doesn't refer to, 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 to the, the size or the, the nature of the book. Uh, it doesn't concise uh, much of it, as I said already, uh, a few days ago. So, I would leave the terms as they are uh, not referring to the content at all. So with my terms, I tried to determine a stage in the development of grammar rather than to reflect the titles of the books. Um, and I thought scholarly um, or something similar is good because it definitely is addressed to very advanced grammarians, not to somebody who is not, who is not versed in grammar and in grammatical theory. We have these in, in halacha, for instance. We have the tour and the Beit Yosef on the halacha, on the uh, on the tour, and then you have the Shulchan Aruch for the ignoramuses who can't handle <laughs> the, the tour, and then you have to have the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch for those who can't handle the the, 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 the Shulchan Aruch, and then you have the art scroll for those who can't. <laughs> <laughs> Will be based on Kitsur Shulchan or on the two? No, on the Kitsur. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. I just want to thank you.